why'd you do that? What do you care? It's like, you, what, is something wrong with it? Yeah, why? I don't know. But they know. You know, things like that have to, children who think hitting's okay and all stuff, that has to be taught. Not hitting each other. You know, little brothers get mad. Yeah, they're going to you know, beat the snot out of each other eventually, especially if you let them. And I think sometimes you should let them beat the heck out of each other. Then whichever one loses is not going to stop picking on the other brother. Of course, they better become a bully, and that's not good either. But still, it's just, there are certain things that have to be taught. Children are not necessar- are not born violent. Violent is taught. It's because of what you let them watch, or when they watch what daddy does to mommy, or all these things. It's like, there is a moral guideline that is implemented, or I'm sorry, instilled in each of us when we're born. That, I believe, hands down. Now, comprehension and understanding comes later, you know. But I, I don't, I do make a distinction there between them. And I would not say that you are not accountable to God just because you didn't know, you know. I mean, if if you die without hearing the gospel, that's one thing, you know. That's a different standard. But just because... I think it just kind of goes back to that, even if you never knew that it was wrong to steal something inside you, you you still know. You know you shouldn't do that. For a social construct or whatever. You know, by the time you're old enough to steal things, usually you're looking around and you didn't go, hey mom, I stole this. No, you're going to hide that candy or stickers or whatever, you know. You're gonna you're gonna hide it because somewhere inside you know you're not supposed to be doing that. I've never seen a kid do something wrong and then go holler, "Hey, look what I did!" Unless they actually did something they shouldn't have done, like took one of Dad's tools and made a car out of it or something, you know, and destroyed it in the process. And that's that might be a little bit different, but you know, that's more ignorance than. But still, I don't know. I just I I don't think it's the same thing. Um, and I think that that was referring to the end game. And not so much the understanding of right from wrong. It's more just at the end, if you, when you, it's regards to the law and your salvation, which is kind of what we're going to get into. And I don't know if I'm actually using that verse or not. I think I might have that verse somewhere in here, which we'll go a little bit deeper into that verse when I when we get to it, if we get to it. Um, any other comments before we continue? Does that make sense, though? We're all tracking. Okay, would you stop trying to delete this thing? Okay, we covered the free will. Now, the scripture that you were focused on was Romans 9-11. That was the primary one, which... uh, And I did not even put it on there. Of course I didn't. (sighs) Sorry, give me a second. No, I don't want that. I want this one. Too many Bibles. Oh, no. Oh, that's what I want. Romans 9, 14, 6. No, that's 10. That's not the one, is it? <laughs> so it says, the older I will, the older will serve the younger. Just as, written, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Um, then verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it, so then it does not depend on man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Here's the thing we have to understand about Romans 9. Okay, Romans 9 is being very, very specific about Jacob and Esau. And then later in a reference to Moses. This is not a... Description of mankind. This was something that God chose specifically between the two. Now, as far as God's reasoning for hating Esau, God's going to have to answer that one for me when I get upstairs because even I don't understand why he would hate Esau. But that is what was written in the Old Testament. Okay? But this is not a description of saying that. God loved your daughter and hated your son. Okay? This is very, very, very point specific to these two sons. 
Okay, when he made a distinction to separate the bloodlines because Esau was the older brother and Jacob the younger. And which traditionally the inheritance that Jacob received should have gone to Esau. Esau sold his birthright to his brother for food. (laughs) Idiot. But you know, it is what it is. And Esau still got blessed. He still had his, his lineage was Billions, millions or billions, and who knows how many people, you know? He was still very blessed. But the difference was, is his bloodline did not produce the Hebrews, the Israelites, the chosen, God's chosen people. That's literally what he gave up. He still had a a birthright, but it wasn't what it was supposed to. What it wasn't, it wasn't what it was supposed to be. But I wanted to take care of that. There is, Romans 9 is not talking about predestination or that trying to imply that, you know, one had a choice and one did not. That was not the purpose in Romans 9. Romans 9 is specifically telling a story to give an example of a scenario of what was going on back then. Okay? And you actually look at Romans. Romans is really good about having themes. Like Romans 8. All of Romans 8 is about grace. And then all of uh, Romans 9... No... Romans 7 is about grace. Romans 9 is about Christ. And it, like a lot of the Roman chapters of Romans, they each have an article or a, uh, a theme. If you actually go through, once you figure what the theme is, you can go through, you can keep finding the theme, like recurring. Like I think grace is mentioned like uh, 28 times or something like that in, in just one chapter, in Romans chapter 7. Grace, just the word grace. It's like grace, grace, grace. The whole chapter is about grace. Okay? So... It's something that it, it's helpful whenever you, if you can find somebody or look online, like, what is this chapter about? And you know, well, that's a grace chapter. And then you take your Bible and you mark how many times you see the word grace. So you can actually see what exactly it is this chapter is focused on, you know. you have Then you have Jesus. Well, <laughs> that's how we get the grace, Okay. And you can apply this to much of Romans. And now, I don't know that anyone's actually done that with any other books of the Bible. I only know that they've done that with Romans. That's a very key feature of Romans. Um, but we're going to focus tonight on Romans chapter 8, which is where we actually see reference for the whole predestination and whatnot. Okay? So Romans chapter 8 is going to be our focus for the predestination discussion. Um, And I'm not going to use the analogy that I had. We're just going to go ahead and exegete these scriptures. I want to start with Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. All right. Everyone there? Now, I'm going to read it, and then we're going to step by step it. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 28, reads, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called, and these whom He called, He also justified, and these whom He justified, He also glorified. Okay, so in there we see the word predestined, which... can get a little tricky. But before we worry too much about that word, that's not where the emphasis is. Because the word predestined means exactly what we think it means. It means you don't have a choice. That's exactly what it means. But that's not where the problem is. That's not where the problem lies in in this verse. Okay, starting again. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. What is this verse talking about? Verse 28. The people that are already called, not the people who haven't been called yet. Now, how do you know that? <laughs> those who have loved God and those who are called according to his purpose. So you're saying that people who are called according to his purpose are people who are saved. Okay. What do you guys think, ladies? I'm not certain that it is because if you have a choice, 
then they could change the whole, um, they could change the whole, whole deal of your whole life. I mean, if you have a choice to follow God or not. But doesn't this say that you've already made that choice? Before that. So, so uh, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. What in there tells us definitively if a choice has been made? There it is. It says, for the good for those who love God. Okay, so, if you love God, you have made a choice. You cannot love without choosing to love. You can lust, but it'd be kind of hard to lust after God. <laughs> it really would, at least in the human sense of it. So, we're talking about those who love God. We're past the point of we're 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 at the point where we can see in this verse that a choice has been made. So let's follow the logic through, or let's follow the verse through. This verse, verse twenty-eight specifically, is talking about Christians. At least at this point, the church. You can call it anything you want, but these people who have given their lives to God, who have surrendered, and these people. Um are those who are called according to his purpose. Because they've already chosen to love him. So because they made that choice, they're called to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. We've got to pause here again. It says, for those whom he foreknew. Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit tricky. Foreknowledge. Okay? We know that God is omniscient, yes? Okay. Well, along with omniscience is foreknowledge. God being omniscient, omni meaning eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. Okay? There's nothing that can be or will be that he does not know before it ever began. God always has been. And yet God always will be. These are concepts that our, our human minds, our finite minds, cannot truly understand. We're Neanderthals, to be quite honest about it. Okay. Now, in this verse, who's it talking about? Well, at verse 28, talking about those who love God. We're just going to say Christians. So, if you continue along, for those whom he foreknew, who did he foreknow? Christians. Now, this, he has omniscient knowledge of all life. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, before he even created Adam, he knew every life that would exist. That's not what this is talking about. This is a reference to an intimacy. It's an intimate foreknowledge. We'll call that a relationship. Okay? So, really what this verse is specifically trying to say is a foreknowledge, those whom he foreknew in a relationship. It's, it's personal. It's between the two. Because you have the love, choice to come to God. And then he gives his purpose. And for these, because these he foreknew... It's not talking about all life or all people of all who would ever exist. It's all who would come to him, all who would love him, who he could use for his purpose, for his glory, to bring about the salvation of everybody else he would he was going to be able to use to get to everybody in. It's it's a this is a private thing. This is still talking about just the Christians. Does that make sense? This foreknowledge is literally in a closed circle. He foreknew who would come to him. So those whom he foreknew. And then you continue. He also predestined. Now this is a. Paul speaking presently. In a future tense. Or speaking past. About a future event. Shall I say. Okay. It's 
in at his present time, he wrote this as